Hello, this is Bradley Cromer from the Math Department at BYU Idaho, and these videos I'll be covering inference for independent of, independence of categorical data, or more simply put, test of independence, as you see on the top of this slide here. So first I'll be doing a little bit of review, then I'll cover hypothesis testing, and then I'll be doing checking requirements and descriptive statistics. So first of all, let's talk. Let's look at this table here. This is what what I call a two by two table. What I mean by two by two is that there are two rows and there's two columns ignoring the totals, the, the total rows and columns, okay? And so here we have, um, out of, uh, the, there's, two different, uh, there's two different groups here, women and men. And we can say that out of the women who use labels to buy clothes, 63 say that they use labels to buy clothes and 233 say that they do not use labels. Whereas with the other group, the men, there's 27 say that you, they would use labels and 224 say that do not. And you can you can use this to do it use a two proportion procedure. Okay, this is what we covered in the last lesson. You can take 63 divided by 296, get a p hat, and get the same thing from n27 divided by 251. Um, but we can also do something with test of independence as well too. Okay. Now, you will see with test of independence, you will see tables that look like this, where there is what's called a row variable and a column variable. The goal is to test to see if these variables are, these two variables are independent of each other, okay? Now, when we do, if we did a two proportion test, we could do it with this. However, it's only limited to where we have two rows and two columns. So we can, and so we can only do this if we have two rows and two columns of information and do, it, and do a two proportion procedure. However, doing a test of independence when we're looking for the independence between these two variables is less limiting, and the row variables can have as the row variable can have as many rows as needed, and the column variable can have as many columns as needed. Okay, so now let's talk about hypothesis testing. So here are the six steps to doing a hypo uh, doing um, doing the doing the test of independence. Step one is to state the null and alternative hypotheses. The null is that the row and the column variable are independent. And the alternative is, is that the row and column variable are not independent. Now, uh, most of your teachers will want you to state what that row and column variable are. So going back two slides back, the row variable is label use, and column variable is gender. So what we would say in this example is, is that gender and uh, label use and gender are, are independent, and the alternative is um, label use and gender are not independent. So step number two is calculate a test statistic. Now here's a formula for it, but you'll be using either Excel to X, SPSS to calculate it. It's the observed count minus the expected count squared divided by the expected count, and then we sum up all of these different numbers. Now this looks this looks a little bit foreign, but basically what you're doing is let me go back a couple of slides. Is that each cell, these four cells, these are the observed counts, and then for each of these cells, there's an expected count, and what that basically is is that it was, it's what we would expect in each of these cells if the null hypothesis is true. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna get an observed minus an expected squared divided by expected for this cell, and then for this cell, and then this cell, and then this cell, and then we sum those up to get our test statistic. But SPSS will calculate all that for us. Okay, step number three is determine the degrees of freedom for the test. So the degrees of freedom is R minus one times C minus one, where R is the number of rows that we have in our in our table, and C is the number of columns. In this case, we have two rows and two columns, so therefore it would be two minus one times two minus one would just be one degree of freedom. Calculate a p-value, you will get that from using Excel or SPSS. And then step five and step six are the same last two steps that we've dealt with with hypothesis testing. We reject the null if the p-value is less than L at the level of significance, if not, we don't reject. So we state things relative to the null. And then we say our conclusions relative to the alternative hypothesis. We have sufficient evidence to say that, and then we state the alternative in English. And if we don't reject, we have insufficient evidence to say that, and then we state the alternative in English. Okay? So let's go through an example of this using, using the label usage data with comparing men and women. There was a recent survey taken on whether consumers are label users who pay attention to label details when buying clothes. Are men and women equally likely to be labels? Determine if gender is independent of label usage. And use a level of significance of alpha equal to point, 0 0.05. The data from the study are summarized in the following contingency table. So here's a table. And so step one is state the null and alternative hypotheses. 
So gender and label usage are independent is the null hypothesis. So it's the row variable and then the column variable. Well, this is written a little bit differently here. If you go back to this slide here, when we look at it in terms of label users, row variable, column variable is gender. Okay. Now the alternative is that gender and label usage are not independent. Okay. So steps two, three, and four, we can get all that information from either Excel or SPSS. Now what I have here is an example of output from SPSS. And here's where I get my test statistic is right here, degrees of freedom and my p-value. And you would get something similar when you use this in Excel. So our p-value is 0 0.001. So our p-value is less than the level of significance, so we'd reject the null hypothesis. And we'd have sufficient evidence to say that gender and label usage are not so we refer to the alternative hypothesis, and we have the sufficient evidence for that. So the next, so first of all, here's the expected counts. I alluded to that earlier. The, it's what we'd expect in each cell, assuming independence between row and column variables, meaning the null hypothesis is true. And here's the formula, if you're curious about the expected counts, is the row total times the column total divided by the table total. So going back to this page here, it's the row, so for this cell, it's the row total times the column total divided by the table total that would get us our, is what we'd expect here if the null hypothesis is true, okay? But SPSS, we can calculate that for you. Now what I want you to do is uh, I want you to stop the video and I want you to go through this problem here, read through it, and then we'll go through the answers here. Okay, so I just want to summarize what's in this paragraph. There was a study done to see, um, study was conducted, why patients seek chiropractic care? Patients were classified based on their motivation for seeking treatment, okay? And so using descriptions, there are five different descriptions of why they seek chiropractic care. There's wellness, preventative health, at risk, sick role, and self-care. So there's five different roles, and you can read through them. Hopefully you've read through these in terms of what these are, and it's also in the online textbook. And then here are the results, okay? The research question was whether people's motivation for seeking chiropractic care was independent of their location. So there's three locations, Europe, Australia or the United States and use a level of significance for alpha equal to 0.05, okay? So then, step one is state the null alternative hypotheses. Location and motivation for chiropractic care are independent, and the alternative is that they are not independent, those two variables. Steps two, three, and four, we get that from either Excel or SPSS. If I look here, I have an example of this in SPSS, and what you see here is that here's my test statistic, which is 49.743. Degrees of freedom in eight, p-value is close to zero, round, rounded, it's, it's zero, approximately zero, okay? So our p-value is less than alpha, so we would reject the null hypotheses, and we would have sufficient evidence to say that location and motivation for chiropractic care are not independent, okay? So then, the last thing I want to cover is checking requirements and descriptive statistics. So first of all, the checking requirements uh, basically, all we talked about expected counts. All of those expected counts are have to be greater than or equal to five. Okay, and then for the descriptive statistics, you can either use pie charts or bar graphs. Now, both SPSS and Excel calculate expected counts, and you can list those. So, going back to the last problem here, here's an example of expected counts. As you for each cell, there's an expected count. Okay. As you can see, with these 15 expected counts, excluding the total, we're not looking at those, all of these numbers are greater than 5. So we can assume that the, require, we can assume that the requirement is met because all the expected counts are greater than 5. You use the graphicals, either pie charts or bar graphs. Here's a couple of examples. Here's a bar chart or, or bar graph that has it divided up by the three different countries, and it has the, the, the different motivations. You can also create a, a pie, ch pie charts as well, one for each country. And so when you do this, it's similar to a two-proportion test, but now say, for instance, we have three different groups rather than two groups. And so we would, so this is really, the, these types of graphs are, are an extension of what we did with two proportions. And that concludes the video dealing with test of independence uh, or inference for independence for cat of categorical.